Ladies and gents, welcome to Off The Record, a podcast here at Rockabye Records, your favourite local record shop. I'm joined here by Right Dad himself, my dad, Dean. How Hi, are you yeah. doing? You yeah, okay? I'm good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, good, yeah. Good, good, good. Um, we are super, super excited to be um, joined here to, today by one of our favourite artists in the shop, um, Marla Mace. How are we doing, Marla? Are you okay? Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing great. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you so much and so excited to be here. Good, good. Yeah, we're we're excited for you to be here as well. You, um, um, for those that for those that don't know, we um we put on a little show with you on um on Saturday, just gone, um, and it was absolutely incredible. We um we had we had a wonderful turnout and um, lots of people tuned in online as well. And um, we uh we yeah we thought you were fantastic, so obviously invited you along to do a a, a small podcast with us. Well, thank you. And um, so we're gonna get we're gonna get into um into what you do, um, who you are, and um, some of the some of the projects you've been working on, and um, but firstly, do you, want, do you just want to tell us about yourself and um, sure. yeah, what what kind of thing you do? Sure. Well, um, I am. <laughs> I do a lot of things, um, and I often think I do all these things, and I think, but I'm not really that. That's just like one of the things. I'm like, yeah. oh, I do this, but I'm not that. But actually, I do do a lot of things. Um, I am a writer performer, playwright. I do music, obviously. Um, <clears throat> I also am a producer, not a music, but more of events and theater stuff. So I, I, I wear a lot of hats where I have worn a lot. Of, I do wear a lot of hats. I can multitask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, speedy mind. Um, so yeah, that's just like a quick... Yeah. Yeah. So, have you, always, <laughs> so have you always been um, involved in the the entertainment or have you, is it just something that's just come um, in the last 10 years or what? Have you always been involved in yeah, theatre and music? I am, I have not been always involved, which is like, I know a lot of people, you know, they started when they were like 10 and they've been forever. And for me, um, I mean, I definitely have been creative. I think in my early 20s, I was like, an English, you know, a literature major at school. So I thought, oh, I'll write stories and short stories and stuff like that. Um, and then I, and I did some, and I just didn't finish a lot of them. And then, like, I wanted to, then I wanted to try acting, because I was always very shy. I was shy as a kid, so I, I, I wanted to try acting, but I was too shy. But then, at like twenty six, I tried an acting class, and I fell in love with it. And so I, I was, you know, involved with that for a while. But it still didn't find my place. Like I was just kind of like, okay, I like that. But I was already, I had a business, I had an, an, um, an event planning company for many years. I'm an event planner too, by the way. Okay. Um, and. But I wanted to like open up my own theater. I lived in downtown New York, Tribeca, which was a neighborhood that now is like the like, you know, shishiest neighborhood in all of like Manhattan or even in the United States. But like when I moved there, it was like met my boyfriend. It was like a raw loft, you know, like the classic New York City downtown thing. And um, and I was like, I want to open my own theater, open my own theater. And he came up with this idea, like we'll do kids parties. I'm like, what? Like it just seemed like why? <laughs> like. But we ended up renting a space, and I thought, okay, I'll do that a year, and then I'll do a theater. And, of course, you know, business doesn't work that way, as you probably know. Um, and it took over, and then I got pregnant, and I, my daughter, but it was always there. And then a few years later, so I actually really started finding my voice, I think, my real artist voice, actually in my, in my early 30s. So everything came a little late, um, definitely late compared to, like, people who start. Um, you know, so I was, I had, I had a, two kids already and I just hadn't done some acting stuff. And then someone said, you know, my friend was taking an acting class because her husband's an actor, he was a working actor. And I was like, oh, I should do that. And she's like, well, why don't you take this class? Creating a one person show. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, that's like, I was like, no, like I'm not Eric Bogosian. I'm not, <laughs> you know, all these, you know, Sarah Bernhardt and like all these John Louisiano. I'm not like that. I was completely not anything. I was like, it's like telling someone, I was just like, and she's like, why not? You like acting, you like writing. And I was like, oh, okay. And I did it and I was terrified, but I just wanted to do something because like my kids were little, just do something creative. And I went in and um, the first thing was like, they went around, they had everyone like, whatever, just to get you used to like creating one person show. She just had like, you know, she used a word like, okay, one person gets a word. I got the word shoes. And you write 20 minutes stream of consciousness. And stream of consciousness is like my thing because I was journaling. I didn't know that that was mm -hmm. a thing. So I just, you know, wrote whatever, 20 minutes. I went, went around and read and then I read what I wrote and everyone was like, oh my God, you're like Eric Bogosian. You're like <laughs> Lou Reed, literally Patti Smith. This wasn't music. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what? This? This shit? This is like what I write every day. Like I didn't think anyone would ever be interested in 
Like yeah. it wasn't that I wanted anyone to be interested in it. So that was like a real, that was the beginning because I stayed in that class with the material, different material. And almost everyone dropped except for me and like three other people. And at mm-hmm. the end we had like a thing, you know, showcase, I guess. And it was like the beginnings of my first play called the, the Canarsie Line, which I am from Canarsie, Brooklyn. And like my friends who came who were like were entertainers and performers and they knew I liked that stuff. I remember one of them came over to me after when she's like, I am so mad at you. And I'm like, why? She's like, you never told us. Like, you're amazing. Like, people thought I'd been doing it forever. Yeah. Which is really interesting because I was like, no, this is like my first, like, kind of well, thing. Yeah. But that really established my voice as, like, this one person show. Who knew? Like I said, it was the opposite of anything. And so from then I went on and I continued and then I did do a play, the Canarsie line, and I did it once as a one person thing, but I ended up doing it as a play. I wasn't in it. Yeah. And that ended up being like my master's thesis. I wasn't in school yet, but I was already writing. I'm like, this is the thesis. Yeah. And I put it up and it, we had a pretty successful run with it. But it was about like a family in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like the beginning. And then I was like, I was hooked. Wow, yeah. Into yeah. theater and also like writing my own stuff. Yeah, well, we you can certainly see that kind of theater, theater-esque thing in, in your music now as well. Mm. Because when we... Um, when we listen to it, it's like um, that kind of mix between music and spoken word, and um, and so um, was it was it kind of an easy transition to go from that kind mm-hmm. of I, su- I suppose the theatre mm-hmm. side of things into into a music side of things. I mean, it was in a way, but it came also in a strange way. So I was doing, you know, I did the shows, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do another play now, and I had another play that I was working on, Man Woman. I might not have been in it either because Canarsie was so cool to see, like you know, my words up in a theater without me being in it, but there was a part of me that's still like, but I like to perform, but I, you know, yeah. and then, um, and I continue taking like acting classes, whatever, like being in a group, but I always brought my own material. Like I didn't go to class and like do scenes. I did like my own stuff. Mm-hmm. And then um, I was like actually in my early 40s. So this is like, this is music came really late to me in the, in the sense of, I was like in an acting group and then I was having a hard time because my daughter was struggling. My daughter was struggling with um, at age, from age 11 on with um, eating disorder and depression. Mm-hmm. And so um, that was very intense. And after a few years of it going on, because when it first started, I thought I didn't know that it was such a hard thing. I really didn't know a lot about it. And so I was like, oh, you know, you Google like eating disorder. Okay, you do this. Nutritionist, adolescent medical doctor, you know whatever, maybe meds. And, and it was, it was so, it's not that at all. And anyone who is struggling with that, I am very sorry. And I know how hard it is. Um, and so, you know, after a few years and her getting a lot of treatment, it wasn't like getting better. So it was depressing. So I kind of fell apart in a sense, you know, I was still strong, but it was like, it was just a long time of it. And then because I was feeling like nervous 24 seven, like I had anxiety 24 seven, not kidding. Like I used to have panic attacks and stuff, but it was like once every six months. And all of a sudden it was like 24 seven. So I, I just discovered, and then she went away for a long time. She went to a treatment center 17 months. Cause I'm like, I have another kid at home. I have to be like, I have to be okay. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I just discovered that when I was singing in the car or something that, that I felt better. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I want to just, I saw in the mornings when he would go to school, I would just start singing. And I start, originally I was singing like just any songs. Like I was singing, so I see Sound of Music, which I know is here, but like, <laughs> that's like a big show in my family. Like in terms of my mother was really into Julie Andrews. So when we, when I was a kid, we'd watch it. And then when my daughter was one, like the three of us. So I would sing like Sound of Music or Edelweiss and then other things too, Cabaret, Chicago. Yeah. And then I would go into the doors. Cause I used to always say, I will say this. I used to always say, you know, I'm really like a Jim Morrison, except I don't write music and I don't sing. But if I were, I should be a rock. I did say right, that yeah. even earlier on. Yeah, yeah. But I'm like, but so I said next life. Oh, well. So I started like, you know, singing and then bring him to class and around my, it could be my words and other people's music. And then all of a sudden I just started writing a lot of songs. Like mm. they just started coming to me. Yeah. This is like before I, you know, met Tomas and all that stuff, mm. Tomas Donker, who I will talk about. It was just like, and I was like, oh shit. And it just made me feel better. And then I started to perform it. Like I actually started doing it in, in on stage yeah. with other friends and like acapella. Like I'm like not, you know, I don't feel like I'm that kind of singer, but it somehow worked. And like a friend of mine, I remember her, Ruth Lembo, she was, Ruth, if you're listening, no, she, um, <laughs> she was like, Marla, this is your thing. She was like, I don't know what it is. It's something about it. This is it. You found your thing. Mm. And it was true. And so then I started doing, and then I met Tomas. So someone mm. introduced, I said, I have to meet someone who, writes music and like really is a musician i mean Mm -hmm. i did play the piano for six years as a kid so i did play classical um but anyway and then a friend of mine was like you should meet my friend tommy she called him tommy and then i met him and i showed him like what i was doing i had this one piece called 
DFWME. Is it okay if I curse on your... So of course, yeah, yeah go for yeah, it. Yeah. The Sex Pistols here. Okay, don't fuck with my emotions. It was like this rant that I did. It was just like yeah. total like from everything going crazy and played him that and and then other songs. And he really believed in me right from the beginning. You know, like as green as I was in terms of like writing music and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And then within like a few months, I was like performing my songs and then, you know, and we're doing more shows and more shows. And then Tomas like, you got to make this into an album. You have the momentum now. You got to make it into an album. I'm telling you, it'll help you sell the show. So then he produced the album. It was the best. He was right. I mean, totally. And then I got hooked. Mm -hmm. And six months later, I put out another album, Speak. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't anymore for a show, though it became a show. So that's kind of like, so music has been really, I would say, since 2008, Wow, yeah. So, yeah, late. So, so I was telling anyone who thinks it's too late. Mm. It's never too late because you know what? As soon as I started doing, like the world opened, like I was going, I was like performing in China within like a year. Wow. Literally, like I got invited, like just crazy shit. It was like the universe was like, yes, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. But it was the mix. It definitely, I think, was the mix of, you know, music. I like, I mean, I like it all. I love doing albums and stuff, but well, I really I'm, do like, a lot of my albums have been turned into shows. I know that, um, you liked it when I when I when I said uh, when I when I on the Facebook when I said we've got Marla Mace coming on Saturday and I did she's a ball of energy she's four foot eleven wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> and she's a cross between John Cooper Clark and Patty Smith and the first thing you said to me I'm not f I'm not four eleven I'm f I'm five four but thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that was really funny when I saw that I was like four eleven I was like I know I might seem small <laughs> my and, my grand, my father was like my grandmother was four eleven. He grew up with her, <laughs> but I, it's small. But but Patty Smith, you know, it's interesting. People often they do. I've since I've started, I get that a lot. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I mean, it's not like I'm a Patty. Fi I do think she's amazing, and I love her writing, and she's an amazing poet. And I mean, anyway, how could you not? And you met her once. Didn't I you? met her once because yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Tomas did the cover. Yeah, of uh, people have the power, which she gave him the permission to do. Which right. is, um, she might have told you that story while he was here. He did, yes, yeah, told us. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you know, yeah. um, but then we went to the concert and uh, one of her first concert after COVID, and we just met her. Me and Tomas were just hanging out with her, and I and I think and I and when I just saw, her, I was like, wow, like you just your pauses are so amazing. And she's like, I know who I am. But that was really helpful for me to hear. Like, right. She knows who she is. That's all you can be. And I always say that. Mm. Now, like, as I, you know, get even older. I know I'm old, but like older, even because I'm not 20, and right? With music, you're supposed to be like 20. You're supposed to be. No, you're not. Don't believe that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's like, when people say, what kind of music do you do? I go, I do Marla Mace really well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. good. I hope, you know. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So yeah, um, going back to um, Tomas then, um, should we talk about True Groove? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, we, we've we obviously, for those that don't know, we did a um, podcast with Tomas already, um, which can be which can be viewed on our on our profile. Um, but um, we're talking about Global Soul and what True Groove is about. And you're one of the co-founders mm -hmm. and um, and you kind of run the record label. So um, tell us a little bit about your involvement yeah. with uh, with True Groove. Okay, so yes, they say I'm the, the coup or the chief operating officer or the mob boss. <laughs> okay. I had a client yeah, did, who once yeah. called me, what are you, the mob boss, in like my event planning. And we kept that because that was very funny. Yeah, Thomas did tell you, say you were the mob boss. See, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. And yeah, like did, when I yeah. signed my letters, so watch out, people. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, so because I was working with Tomas on, I was working with him on my albums and he was producing them and mm -hmm. then we were touring together and we, we toured England before, you know, like I did a, we did a duo thing. Mm. It's like me up front and him doing everything else behind. And so he really admired my like going after it, like, because he worked with a lot of artists who didn't like really like go for it and mm -hmm. like pushing and marketing and, and I was when I started, like I really was. And, um, and then we just, you know, we started working more and more together and then when we got when he just started to really form True Groove, you know, I'd been with him for years and he was like, definitely was like, Marl, I want you, like, you're one of the owners. We did a lot of stuff to it. Like, we would like, so I was like, sure. And then James Del Tacoma, who's our other partner, he's, he's like- He's the bass player. Of the yeah, yeah, bass player, but he's the mastermind engineer. Yeah. We mm -hmm. work out of um, Bill Aswell's studio in Orange, New Jersey. It's called Orange Music Sound Studio. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if anyone knows Bill, he's pretty iconoclastic and major music person. And, mm -hmm. We were so fortunate to work out of his studio, yeah. which is like, you can record a 40-person orchestra. And it also was originally owned by, it was originally built by Frankie Valley, 
I don't know if Tomas told you this. He never knew. Yeah. Told us this. No. This is the, where we record out of Bill's studio. He right. It was originally built by Frankie Valli. Jethro Tull owned it for a while. Carol King. I mean, it has like a legacy. Yeah, yeah. And then it's Bill's studio. And then he just one day told Tomas, "Why don't you work out of my studio?" He's like a mentor of Tomas's, and Tomas was like, he didn't take him up in it at first. And then one point, he's like, "I told you, why don't you work just just meet James?" Because James ran Bill's studio. James has been working with Bill for years as his like studio manager and and also engineer there. And then we just started working together. My album, my album might have been the second or first album that James produced with us. And mm -hmm. then so it was just the three of us because mm -hmm. they are they're the ones who produce all the True Groove records. Mm -hmm. James and Tomas are the producers, yeah. and they're incredible. Um, and I am more like the operating person. And well, the, I remember the the, the first the first <laughs> the first time that um, you came to do uh, or True Groove All Stars came to do a gig here. Um, I think JR told us that it was going to be an acoustic set with three of you. Mm. And then, of course, Mark rocks up, right? And then, right. And then uh, James rocks up as well. And then Thomas comes in with Sam, and and then there's another three. And before we know, it, we've got we've got seven people in this in in, yeah. right. in this little area where we're, where we're doing this podcast, mm -hmm. and we've got a whole band. And it's thinking, okay, this is going to go down well. This is great. Mm -hmm. And of course, that the start of a brilliant friendship. You know? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that was an I saw that I was in New York, and it was an incredible um, yeah. show. They're they're great. I mean, I've been working with these guys for a long time. So because of that, so like we've produced, you know, and I've talked about like we've produced, because he doesn't know the numbers, but I do. Like yeah. we've produced over 500 projects since 2014, um, you know, over like, you know, songs, I guess. And then over 100 albums produced. Tomas probably co-wrote majority of them. He co-writes for a lot of the artists mm. and also a lot of his own. He's an artist on the label. Mm. Um, and... I'm really proud of the work we've done. This it's just so much work, and we've done like show, like my show. When I put up my show, the pill, the play, which was in um, La Mama, which is a pretty you know well known, it's a legendary theater in New York City, but actually in Europe people know about it a lot. And I put up that show, and they did the sound. Mark, we'll have to introduce you guys to Mark. You know, Mark and James and Tomas. Mm -hmm. You know, did the sound for the shows, like all my shows. You know, like we've done a lot of theater. We've done this. Tomas has endangered projects, so we. We're not just, we do music for sure, but it's like, it's, as Tomas likes to say, and I'm sure he told this story because he was like, it's art and culture. Yeah, yeah. Did he tell that story? Marla, because yeah. he always tells that story. It's like, Marla, we're not in the music business anymore. Yeah. Right? You know? he, said, yeah, yeah. He, gave us, he gave us a bit of a snarky answer and said, um, it's, um, it's a record label for, what did he say? For music before... Before music got shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Right, it sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he always like, exactly. So I'm not going to say that, but yes, I mean, in the sense <laughs> yeah. of, but Global Soul, like people will think right away, Global Soul means like, you know, you know, world music. Yeah. Or just soul music, but it means just literally global soul. Like it is soulful music. Yeah. yeah. Any genre. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we are all such different genres. Absolutely. Um, I even do a lot of different genres, but I have like, I'm like the Marla May genre, but like, you know, as you know, Tomas, I mean, his, him and James both, their knowledge of music is just yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, they're, everything. They're, they're incredible, and yeah. you know, we we could see that in in your in your show as well when you when you're here, and um, yeah. So um, you're gigging in the UK at the moment, mm -hmm. yes. um, and um, tell us a little bit about yeah, where where you're going to be, and um, we're where not sure. Been, yeah. yeah, we're not sure whether whether this podcast is going to be available for after after that but that's okay, <laughs> Did you, but that's okay. you go yeah. back you go back on the 10th is that right i go back on the we're leaving the 12th you leave the 12th but that's my right, last yeah. gig is on the 10th right yeah. that's what, yeah that's what i was going to be saying yeah yeah so cool. um but i will tell you where i'm playing yeah afterwards because yeah. maybe you want to invite me back yeah yeah, yeah. Um, which we're thinking in july so okay uh well, first of all, the first one was at Rockabye, which well, was amazing. Thank you. And at first I was a little scared. I was like, oh, that's going to be the first one because I feel like it was going to be so, I don't know what I thought. Like, I don't know. And yet I love intimate. My favorite is like an intimate crowd exactly that was here. It was like, there was a lot of people here for, you know, there was a lot of people yeah, here yeah, and yeah. I liked it. So, and I was really, so I'm so happy it was. Yeah, yeah. And so thank you. Um, and it was then, great you. Yeah, it was so, it was really really great well, it's just a natural it's just a, it's it's a it's almost like well you know this home and mark mm -hmm. mark knows he's got his own parking space mark has now because <laughs> you know I mean? right. he's, he's been here so often right and it's like um it's just a, a, a it's just a, a, a place where you can just come and do you do what you got to do and people will just love you for it because it's a it's a record shop and people 
who come to record shops love music, right. you know, yeah. isn't exactly. it? And that's it, exactly. isn't it? Which, you know, and it, it was it was a good, it was a good, it was a great show. Mm. You Thank know? you. And I was just so like. Like, you know, like, I, you know, it's so great when you get like a bunch of people and they're actually, like you said, they're generous, like, and listening and really gauging and, and interested. And, you know, that was just, you know, a real gift. Yeah. Yeah. A real gift. I've, I've had, I've had um, a few uh, people came in um, on the Sunday who were, who were here on mm-hmm. the Saturday. And it was more about the, the, the people were saying about the writing, right, of, mm-hmm. of your songs, mm-hmm. you know. And one line especially came up, and it was the art of pissing in the bushes going undetected right. is one of the cleverest lines ever. Yeah. But it's just something that we, <laughs> we can all relate to. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, a, and, it's the, and it's the truth. It is. Because yeah. I wrote that for that song, 830, which was written during COVID. Absolutely, and it was... Yeah. Literally, I was afraid to go to the bathroom. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you were going out, like during mm, lockdown, yeah. there was nowhere to go. And I'm like... You know, who's going to go into it? First of all, nothing was open. And if something was open, it's like, I'm not going into anyone like st- restaurants, bathroom. Mm. Like, no way. Like, the safest is to be, you know, yeah. and I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured, I mean, it really, <laughs> yeah. and I just threw that in the song. And yeah, that's, that's fun. And actually, a woman came over to me after the show and said that she really, she said, I'm stealing a quote from you. And I was like, oh, okay. And she's like, the one is a line in my song, um, Superhero, where it says, I'm a simple woman. Um, an oxymoron, you know, a living, breathing oxymoron. She just said like oxymoron about being a woman, mm, oxymoron. Yeah. And I was like, oh, thanks. I thought that, I remember when I first wrote it and I was like, are you sure about that? Because I said, isn't a woman itself like an oxymoron in a sense? <laughs> anyway, women yeah, yeah. in general. We're not going to go into but, that. But then, the, but that superhero song is great because because um, I remember you said, when, you, when you introduced it, you said, we all crave for a superhero. Once one comes along, we can't handle it, isn't it? Right. And it's and it was just oh my goodness, that is just mm. that's just awesome, you know. Oh, thank you. Because it is, it's, it's clever writing. Oh, thank you. you. Know? I mean, yeah. that's that's what I like to do. I like to yeah. you know do music, but also tell a story. And this, in a way, I and I knew I was doing this tour. I thought this is going to be like the foundation for a new <clears throat> one woman show, which will have the music for sure, um, but will you know? Because I have theme, and mm. I feel like there was an arc. I mean, it's not like I'm sitting here like, you know, I mean, I did think about it, but not like yeah, yeah. a lot of it was just what came up. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's really what I like to do the most because I like to like really communicate, talk. I mean, I love doing like all that, like obviously here, like rock and roll. It's so fun, you yeah. know, and it's mm. and I can do that. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah. So thank you. So when so when um, when we because I'm, I'm I, on Saturday night, when we when, when you'd finished there, we all ended up going for the to the Indian restaurant, mm-hmm. didn't we? And yes, we, we, we did. Yeah, it, was, it was a that was a, a, a and even get to know you even better then, mm-hmm. you know. And it was you mentioned your dad being in theatre, and he started at eighty three, was it or eighty five? Eighty seven. Oh right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's young. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is the amazing thing. So like, a lot of people are actually songwriters in my family, but I wasn't. But anyway, but my dad. Okay, so he's always been. He's a He's a psychologist, but he's organizational. He works in business. He's a clinic. He's not a clinical like, but he's always been like everyone. Always loved my dad. I mean, it's like everyone maybe loved yeah, my yeah. dad. Yeah, like everyone just loved him. He was always like great guy. He's a mentor for many people. He still works. So he was still working at eighty seven. My mom had Louis body dementia. She passed away um, at the end of December twenty twenty two. She had had it for quite a while. So she was bed bound for a long time, um, and you know, for four and a half years. Yeah. And ultimately, actually, she got COVID. And, and when she got COVID, that was that. Um, so my father, but he was still working during the time. He Most of his work is on the phone. Like, he has people who know him and they can't make a move without him. But they've never even seen him in person, some of them. Because he works, he has a big client in Rhode Island. He's, you know, and he's, you know, he talks to him on the phone. Anyway, so after my mom died, he just knew that he needed to do more. Even though he was still, he's working, but it's like, He's a, he's a natural caretaker, so like okay, his wife of sixty six years too, and and then um, my acting coach, director, friend, someone who I've been with years, one of these people I was talking about, who I brought in the songs and started singing. She came over, and I said, "Dad, read her, read Elizabeth your songs. I mean, not your songs. Read her your stories." He had written all these stories when he was like fifty four, yeah, um, about uh, growing up in Brooklyn in the forties and fifties, and then she started reading. She's like. Howard, this has to be a show. And I'm like, Dad, yes, <laughs> just do it. And and she was like, and Marla can be. He's like, as long as Marla's in, and I'm like, definitely, let's do it. And like I said, the, as soon as she walked out, I'm like, we're doing this. Like, yeah. I'm serious. 
I didn't know what it was going to be. And then we rehearsed it. That was in January. By April, it was up. And it's like my my father with his stories, but she got him acting, even though like he his New York City stage debut, 87. No, some people never get that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And he killed. He killed. And she he's still red, but she had him. She He's acting. Yeah, yeah. And he's good. Yeah. He's great, actually. And then I come in and I do like, just growing up in Brooklyn in the 70s. And then there's this father-daughter stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I do three songs in it, actually. Yeah. Um, none of the ones that I, none of the ones that I did here. But yeah. there are three songs in it. And um, and then it just sold out. Like, my father has these fans. So, like, it was sold out. And then we did another one. It was, like, st- standing ovation, sold out. I was like, all I do is put a picture of my father, like, kind of tap dancing. He doesn't really tap dance. <laughs> but, like, moving. And everyone's like, oh, my God, I'm coming to that show. Yeah, yeah. People have come three times, like, without being my best friend. Yeah. And then we did it again, and now we got booked. We have four bookings. Is when I come back from England, besides having a couple of music gigs, I have the show with my dad. We're doing one in Rhode Island. Amazing. Beginning April 6th, of April 5th, and then on April 17th in Westchester, New York. Yeah. We have a bunch of things, so it's amazing. And he got the bug of performing. I'm like, it's, it's kind of like, yeah. you know, we're backstage. He's like, I can't believe we're... We're doing this. But he's positive. He's more positive. Yeah, than yeah. Me. I'm worrying about the audience and he's going to be affected like they're not, if they're not clapping. And he's like, we go into the intermission. He's like, I think they love us, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like going, oh my God, they're not laughing enough. And he's like, they love us. Yeah, yeah. He's such a great attitude. Yeah. My daughter called it popativity because she called him pop. Right, Papa. Okay. So yeah, growing up in, um, in New York and mm-hmm. Brooklyn, um, it must be, because I've, I've only ever been to New York once. You've probably been twice or so or three times or... I've been a couple of times, yeah. 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 Um, I just found it was like a, it was almost like a hub for creativity and a lot of, a lot of creative people there. Mm-hmm. Did that kind of, is that, is that an influence for you? Is New York a, a, a big influence on, on what you, what you write and stuff or is it, mm. because I, I know a lot of people do write about New York because it, because it's this kind of, well, it's, it's an amazing place and um, some some of our favourite music is, you know, New York this, New York that, that kind of thing. Is is being in New York kind of a, a, an inspiration and an influence or is it or is it something different? Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting question because because I'm a New Yorker and a native New Yorker, Yeah, I think it's just who I, it's like so part, and you can hear my accent, like it's so part of who I am. Yeah. So like, for example, when I wrote that first play that I was talking about, the Canarsie line, that when I first started writing those monologues, I thought, I don't know, I had this monologue about this woman, Loretta. In my head, it was like Southern, <laughs> like some Southern yeah. William Faulkner. I don't know if you know William Faulkner, like thing. And like my, and I remember doing it with my acting teacher. She was like, oh, that's so Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> like yeah. I can't get the Brooklyn out of me. So that's why it became like this Canarsie line thing because I know that language. I know the thing. So I, it, I know it. It's just part of who I am. And I grew up in Brooklyn, um, in the seventies and Brooklyn then was very different than Manhattan, let's say, because yeah. everyone thinks of New York, probably they think of, you know, the city, in Manhattan, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know? And, um, and at that point when I grew up, like Brooklyn was like Brooklyn and it was, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Sad Night Fever. Yeah. Uh, I've Tony, not seen yeah. it yet. Tony Monero. Tony Monero. <laughs> yeah. So that was like what I grew up with. Like to like the whole thing was like him to get to Manhattan. Remember he's like yeah, dating yeah, yeah. her and she's like, you know, why don't you move to Manhattan? You know, and even though she's still like, <laughs> And uh, to get across that bridge. And I kind of felt like that growing up, like where I grew up, like, oh, I could, like, when I, I didn't know it when I was younger, but yeah, once yeah. I got older, it was like to be where the cool, creative people were and not just like in this, you know, provincial mm-hmm. town, even though it was fun growing up there. Um, so that, and, but now Brooklyn is now like what Manhattan used to be. Brooklyn is like, yeah, that is the shit. Yeah. So I can't believe that I eventually moved. Like, I thought when I left, I would never want to move back. Mm. You know, like, oh, you know, and now, like, I moved back in 2015, and I can't imagine ever, like, always not having a piece of Brooklyn. I don't want to live yeah. where I lived, where I grew up, and that part is still, like, old school Brooklyn. No offense, anyone, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's just because it's, like, how we grow up. Yeah, yeah. But New York, I don't think now it's as, you know, I'm on a different age. I don't think it's as creative, maybe, than it was, like, when New York was in its heyday, yeah. like, in the 70s and 80s, because, first of all, it's too expensive. Yeah. So, like, back then, right, when Patty was there and all yeah. those people, like, they were squatting in apartments and paying cheap rent. And yeah. now, if you're an artist, unless you, I mean, you can be a really great artist and have and, and come from a rich family or have money, but that's kind of, how else can you... Yeah. Like how much can you live there? Mm-hmm. Although there, there, there is a scene, and, I, and we work with this um, Dylan Mars Greenberg. I'm not sure if 
if Tomas mentioned it, um, and Dylan is a, she's 26 and she's a brilliant filmmaker. We met her when she was 18 and she already had like five feature films out. And she does like these B-movies, trauma films and stuff. I don't know. Right. If, and so I'm bringing up Dylan because um, she's part of like this very interesting creative um, group. And she does music as well. She has mm -hmm. this band called Theophobia. But she's part of this very creative group of people. A lot of it's like trans world, more like trans, LGBTQ. But we just produced her. Uh, we would just produce her, rec her her latest feature film. I don't know if that was mentioned. So yeah, yeah. True Groove is is the producers on it. Mm -hmm. Tomas and I and James did all, all the sound and we have songs. I have a, I wrote a song for it and they did the score. Yeah. Um, so that 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 group of people is interesting. You know, they're creative. Um, but I just feel like it's just so part of, like I said, it's so part of who I am. So I think yeah. all my material tends, I think tends to be that way. Definitely yeah. like Canarsie line. And then I think of, you know, just, yeah, the pill. Cause it's like, that was really based on my family. Like literally- I asked my mother, father, daughter, and son, and me, we all wrote, like, it was kind of like, I don't know if you know the film Rashomon. It's a Kurosawa film where, like, you know, it has different points of view. Like, everyone tells the same story, and everyone tells it a different way. So I had everyone in my family tell this story. Mm. And you you write about that incident when, you know, when I took the pill. I took my daughter's antidepressant by accident. And I freaked out, and I, like, had a nervous breakdown. But it, was, it wasn't because of the pills, just I was ready to. Mm -hmm. And everyone wrote it, and everyone wrote something really different. Like, my son wrote it as a teleplay. He actually wrote it first. And it was hilarious. Like, he wrote it as, like, this over-the-top black comedy. Then I wrote it as a play. And then my daughter just wrote it as an essay when mom took my crazy pills. Mm -hmm. And then my father was like, I don't know what, the, what he was thinking. It was like, it wasn't even the same story. And then I interviewed my mom. <laughs> and then we mashed it all together. And it was a really funny play. It was about, you know you know, dealing with a teenager who was struggling with um, eating disorder and depression, but it had black humor in it. And, and she was alive when we wrote it. And it, it had suicidal in it. Like, would she kill herself? Like it ended with like, does she kill herself? Does she not? But it was still the day that La Mama said yes to producing, which was a big deal. It was the day she killed herself, my daughter. I mean, just coincident. I mean, you know, she didn't kill herself because of that. That's the no. point. Whether it's yeah. a coin, you know, in terms of the world, but we still put it up. And um, I don't even know how I got to that. <laughs> Actually, now I'm like, why did I even bring up all that? But that's also about like, you know, we're all over the top and it's very much like a New York family. Let's just put that. Even yeah. though I think it's, someone once said, someone who's read it said or, that it's like a kaleidoscope of like every American. And I would even assume, you know, presume to say it could be like every family all over the world, Western world at this point, like struggling with young people who are yeah. struggling because it's a hard time for young people. It yeah. is. Um, but it was a very much like a New York vibe. So we don't have to talk about it if you, if you don't want to, but is, is your, is your daughter passing away kind of a, a big part of who you are as a, as a, as a person and yeah. a part of your music and stuff? Well, now it is. And she died in 2017. So, you know, before that, I mean, it was, you know, I started doing music while she was away. She's the singer in the family. I mean, yeah, she, told us that. She she's was... an amazing singer. She, <clears throat> I mean, since she was two, it was like, she was this incredible singer. Huh? And ultimately she went, ended up going to USC, which is in California in mm -hmm. LA. It's like a big school. I mean, maybe you know it. And it, and it was a new program, Thornton School of Music, where they had started a new program called Pop Music Program. And she was in the second year of its existence. And she was in... She was in like, they were like, they accept 20 people from the, like the country or like 20 wow, people yeah. in. And she was one of the singers and she was in there with like John Fogarty's son, like all these like famous people's sons, wow. Shane Fogarty. And he's, he tours with his dad now. John Fogarty is like a big uh, endorser of the program. Like, and one of the Doobie brothers, I can't remember one of the Doobie brothers kid, Billy Childs. And yeah. I mean, he's incredible. And his son was in the program. So like all these, like a lot of that and she was in it and, um, and she finished you yeah. know, she, she had suicide attempts before and she, she loved, um, she was struggling a lot. So she, she loved USC and loved California and mm -hmm. wanted to come back. She struggled a little bit with like a conservatory program just cause like, I don't want to write a string arrangement. I just want to sing. Yeah. 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 And we produced two of her records. So we, she has two albums out on True Groove, yeah. which we're going to, we now, one is called Burden to Bear and one is called Life in Color. And she's on other, um, compilations. And now we are re, Tomas and James have re, mixed all of her songs so they're almost like new versions and we had a couple of songs that she had um right before she died she was starting she had kind of not stopped singing but for a while she was like how could i mom i always thought i'd be doing this but like how could i do this like i'm so sensitive like you know it'll kill me 
So I was like, okay. I mean, she didn't mean like that. She just meant like it just like she's so sensitive and to have all that, you know, and she was beautiful, like attention. But right before she died, she started, she wrote two new songs. She was about to do a new album. And we just, she just did like the demos mm. with like Tomas, how they usually would start. She would, you know, she came to the tune like everyone does, you know, comes to the tune and singing and then he, you know, focuses it. And they just had the initial, you know, iPhone recording, mm. two of them. And they were able to extract her vocal. She's such a good singer, just from these like, raw demos and they created wait when you hear these songs you won't believe we, uh, honestly, you'll, you'll hear one of them insidious wait, yeah. is unbelievable yeah. Yeah. what they created around but it was already the song and she also are they, are they available to listen to now or? they're not available not those her other her, her records that are out yeah burden to bear on spot of all of the platforms mm. her name is lael summer lael summer um that's s-u-m-m-e-r lael l-a-e-l um, but her burden to bear, there's YouTube videos of her singing at the blue note, um, and, and stuff like that. But the new things it's, and also she used to sing, even though she wasn't singing, she said she would, she would just secretly sing on this, like one of these karaoke apps, like a carpool karaoke app. Yeah. And she sang incredibly. And one of the, when she died, they wrote me and they were like, we're so sorry that they knew somehow, like your daughter died and here are all the videos. She was our favorite singer that anyone has ever been on this thing. And we have a couple of surprises from that as well, like extracting. Yeah. So anyway, but as far as her, so yes, I have written, I wrote a lot about her. Yeah. Like that whole don't fuck with my emotions thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about me falling apart with like, my marriage was having a hard time and mm. like my daughter and it was just like all like, ah, like, you know, I need help. Like literally it yeah. ends. And it's actually a song on my first album, Brief Night Out. It's not a rant, it's a song. Um, and I have songs, I have a song called Hold You, which is about... Well, before she died, it might sound like she died, but she didn't. Um, and on my new, my new album coming out, which we wrote a while back, but it's not out yet. It's, it's a song called. When I do that poem, I don't know. You heard me the day I did a poem like, uh, like Demita, if I were a narcissist. I, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's actually a song I wrote called um, Demita, which is that those were taken from the song, mm. but it's actually <clears> a song. Um, and I have a lot of songs about her, but I'm holding, I have a ton. I could write like a whole album I've written. Yeah. And I also have written, I got on the piano and I did like a classical opus. It kind of just one day, like in 2018, I just sat down. It was like, it's almost like the day she died. And it was like my, about like me and like my feelings, but also like her, like as if her voice was coming through me, channeling and being like, you know, all this stuff and like that it was magical and it was okay. And that yeah. they forgave me, mom. And I really want, I'm looking, and I've talked about like, you know, I want a real, classical composer it might be the true groove because true groove people are amazing yeah, <laughs> they yeah. can do anything and it might I would like to put that out actually mm. um, so yeah yeah well it's a powerful thing isn't it like um, like like we were saying earlier like um, music is is a, is a therapy um, not not just not just writing and, and composing but um, listening as well you know we have yeah. people that come in come in all the time and you know saying you know how can how can we how can we live without music and 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 um and writing music and stuff um yeah, so yeah so it's true. it's important to to write about these things and it's important to talk about them i think I mean, um, for me i have to like i remember yeah. one person like coming over to me when someone was like it doesn't define who you are i'm like um it does not that i'm like that's it's like and you know it's not like in a mean way i did this in a writing workshop but yeah. it's like yeah, I know I'm also other things, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You know, I do this, this, and this. But to say, to just, to be a mother and lose a child, there's no way that it doesn't completely explode the foundation that I stand upon. Yeah, It doesn't mean that I don't want to be alive. Mm -hmm. I do. And I'm here for the long haul. Um, but it definitely changes everything. No Absolutely. question about it. Yeah. Well, thanks, for sh thanks for sharing that with us. That's, that's, that's you know, heart rendering, you know. Yeah. It yeah. is. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, well, it's, it's horrible. It yeah, is horrible. I, I, yeah. You, can't, you can't. Yeah, you know. So let's um, let's talk about the new album. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not out yet. Um, right. But it might be out when we, when we put this podcast out. So um, right. it's volume two. Is that volume right? Volume two, which of, um, a fine art of pissing in the bushes. We're it. continuing <laughs> with the, uh, the fine art of pissing in the bushes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So like that song, Demeter's on there. Um, song that I might be doing in the next few days in these gigs, which I never said where I'm going to be performing, but uh, there's a song, Silent, that I did, which is really punk, kind of like Slater Kinney. Okay. I didn't intend it to be that way, but it is. It's two minutes and six seconds. Yeah. But I'm like, 
Like, yeah. we nailed it. I mean, <laughs> I feel like we, I nailed it, and you know, and, and Tomas as well. And the way we write is always different also, by mm. the way. It's not How, like he writes the music and I write the lyrics. Hound Dog was two minutes, six seconds by Elvis exactly. Presley, and that just... Look at that. Yeah. Changed the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, I had nothing else to say, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, yeah, I have a bunch of songs. You know, there's another song, Somebody Else, which is going to be on a compilation that's coming out soon. Um... Um, the true groove like five of artists are putting out and that, that's and that's a kind of funny song because it's kind of like I don't know if you know Blossom Deary Blossom Deary yeah, yeah. She, yeah Ronnie Scott yeah she's, mm-hmm. she's a big big um, we've got a couple of her albums here she's yeah an amazing amazing voice amazing. and she played yeah. so like during lockdown I just started listening to her a lot I don't even know why like it just came up and I was just like into that kind of you know her and like that that time period so I wrote this. This song I actually wrote on the piano, like I actually did, and, and um, called somebody else. And I'm excited about that. And it's kind of a little Peggy Leeish mm-hmm. too, I would say. Right. Even yeah. though I don't, yeah, definitely, I do like this funny. It's like very, you know, it's about a breakup, which I don't really write about that too much, but it is. And then there's like this crazy ending. You'll, you'll hear it. Um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and a bunch of other tunes. Yeah. So um, if people want to um, check out some of your music already. Um, uh, where, where can they find it and what's um what's it what's it available on? It is on all the usual, so of course Spotify, you know, Apple, Amazon and and a million other places. Yeah. You can Google me. I'm pretty Googleable, I will say that. A lot yeah. of pictures, a lot of things. I used to have really long hair. Um it's Marla Mace. It's uh M A R L A M A S E dot com if you want my website, which is brand new and updated. Yeah. So that's good. And um you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm not on TikTok. I'm sorry to say, but happy to say, actually. You <laughs> yeah. know, I know it's important. <laughs> it's, it's, it's addictive, uh, TikTok, and it's, uh, yeah. Um, All of it is. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. horribly addictive. Um, we, we, love, um, we, loved your, we loved your set, as, as we said, um, on, uh, on Saturday that we're, that's just gone. Um, and it's hard, it was hard to kind of put our finger on kind of, um, a I genre, suppose yeah. a genre, and and suppose, um, yeah, what what you're about. Do you have kind of like a any influences that you that you'd kind of compare yourself to? Because we we were trying our hardest, weren't we? We said we yeah. said Patty Smith and yeah. John Cooper Clark and mm-hmm. stuff, and and um, and a few other people. But have you got like people that you that you kind of look up to, or albums that kind of really inspire your sound, or that kind of thing? I guess. I mean, there are artists that I have, you know, loved, you know, like I, like, um, I'm, I always love the who, but Pete Townsend. Yeah. When I was like a teenager, like I was, I wanted to meet him. I wanted to like talk to him. Mm-hmm. I just loved his writing and his, and his words. And also I love the who songs, but like particularly, I mean, Pete is, you know, obviously in terms of the who, but in terms of like his solo stuff and his, so that definitely had a big impact on me i don't know if i sit down and i go i'm gonna write a song like pete townsend although i've certainly have asked to do a cover of like there was one that i wanted to do um i've had enough from quadrophenia Mm. i have to convince tomas though (laughs) no it's not up to him well you 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 were looking over there weren't you oh i just saw it and it was the album better you bet better you bet which was like a huge song for me absolutely yeah when that album came out i was in high school and i met my first real boyfriend like tr- like you know official not like the guys i had a crush on that yeah, were yeah. like assholes or whatever you know i mean like in brooklyn just i mean michael and it, it was like our song you better you bet mm. and i yeah. just remember him like doing this funny thing with his hand with it and actually when i met another guy later on in my 30s who was um also we danced to you better you bet so that just song has a thing but um a lot of the who songs i love like uh what's the one? Oh my god now i'm like crazy um blue God, this is crazy. The one who plays the, like the ukulele, blue, gray, and blue. <laughs> oh my God. That's Barbara, that's not Barbara Riley. No, no? not Barbara no. Riley. No, it's like one that it's like, some people say I'm sad in the morning. You know, I don't know the who well enough, do you? I'm, do you know yeah. what? Blue, gray, I'm just forgetting it now. I'm spazzing out. Yeah. This is not, this is why, you know, don't ask me. Um, yeah. Blue, gray, and something gray and blue. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure the uh, I'm sure the uh, yeah. The I'm so be, sorry uh, because yeah, I know it. I'm just this is I'm <laughs> getting like brain fog and here. And you know what happened, don't you? People will be saying, "God, he's have a record shop. You don't even know what that song is, honey." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but there was go back to you better you bet right memory in my in, mm-hmm. when it came out. Um, I used to have this uh, friend at school, um, Robert, and mm-hmm. he loved that song. 
And whenever we'd walk to school, mm-hmm. he'd be going, and we'd be doing this little duet together, and he'd be going, when I say I love you, you say you better. And I'd be going, you better, you better, you better. <laughs> no, so that, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> it was just one of them songs exactly. that we used to just, just, just sing all the way to school. It was brilliant. Yeah, you no, know? I love that. And it was because yeah. that was like that album that hadn't they hadn't released an album in a long time. And no, that's it was like right. that yeah. album. And I also noticed here, it's not such a big influence on me, but it was a big it was in my life because <clears throat> I see them over there. This is the Moody Blues. My brother, yeah. my older brother, it was a fanatic Moody Blue fan growing up. Like his whole like every one of those albums I said are still on the walls of the room in Canarsie Brooklyn's my mother never changed it. People laughed like the house is like an homage to the seventies. And all he still, he just recently went, and he's not so much, he still went and saw them recently, or Justin Haywood or one of them. Well, that, this is the so Moody... I still only grew up with them. Yeah, this is the Moody Blues. Mm-hmm. It's probably the best five pound you will ever, <laughs> ever spend on an album because it's the, one of the cheapest albums mm-hmm. in the shop and you're thinking, oh my goodness, how is this only a fiver? Because it's, right. it's just... A, it's well, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a greatest hits album, but it's a, it's a medley of their greatest hits, isn't it? Oh, really? It just mm-hmm. rolls into one. And it's just like <laughs> almost like a concept album. It's like it's just yeah, right. just superb. Yeah, but it's just funny that I see it here. It's not like I mean I did listen to a lot because I'm like the younger sister, so you know my mm. my big brother is like the hero. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't say that like you know they yeah. influenced my um and um I I have to like I definitely love the Beatles. I mean I know that's like obvious, but mm. for everyone, but like you know it just. I mean, how could you not be influenced by the Beatles? I just don't. I don't know how people can say they're not. It's I don't think the, anyone who's a pop yeah. writer can not. It's, have, it's like when it's like when, it's like oh, when pe- the Beatles something. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. when people write to us and they say um, um, the Beatles are overrated, I'm like, yeah, I, I can't, I can't answer that. I can't, I can't, I can't reply to you. I'm sorry because you can't. The Beatles can't be overrated. They they, they, they can't be overrated, can they? They just they just they were just so influential in yeah. so many. Just for so many people. It's one of those exactly. things where it's just that, like, you work backwards and it'll always end up at the Beatles. No, kind of, kind of, no matter what. And um, yeah, like, I don't know. It's I just... mean, modern song. I know before that it's the blues and all that stuff, mm. but like modern stuff. And and I did. Um, I do really like the Clash. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, particularly. I mean, a lot of the Clash. But I love London Calling. I can always mm-hmm. listen to that album. And every time, like now, we're staying. They said we're staying like around the corner and mm. there's a hedge in front and I keep going, you know. Yeah. You know, hedge back in the, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to we had a hedge back in the suburb. I'm like, oh, I love Lost in the Supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I do, yeah, the Clash was really, in fact, one of the last, when I started doing that song Silent, the one that I just said sounds maybe like a little Slater Kinney, who I really don't know their music that well. But I told Tomas I wanted to have like a clashy vibe. And I, because I already mm. started it, but I, you know, he needs to fine tune. It's actually an interesting way we write because sometimes I'll come to him with like a pretty full melody because mm-hmm. I'll just hum it and then he'll get it. And then he'll always finesse it and make it better. Um, but sometimes we've done albums where it's like they'll just give me, they'll give me the, uh, the beats. They'll give me like like in Half Life album. They gave me the beats, and I just because it's easy for me to make. It's easy for me to get if I hear like music, I can just make up words on the mm. spot. That's easy for me. Um, but I have you know often. It's not like I'm just a lyricist. I definitely do come up with you know depends. So that's yeah. But that one, I was like, I want it to be more. Um, yeah. So I don't know what genre I am. No. Yeah. I mean, I like Squeeze when I was you know mm. a lot. Yeah. You know, um, I've different until they're different until Brooklyn. The Kinks, I mean, they're awesome writers. The King, the Squeeze, Squeeze, oh, Tilbrook, oh, yeah, yeah Tilbrook absolutely. Different. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. just, a, just well, the, some of the best we've ever had. They are, aren't mm. they? I, you know? I think so. And I saw them yeah. a bunch of times. Like in Ray concert. Davis as well, you know. Yeah, again, Kinks. I did. I do have like a thing, you know, Jim Morrison. I said that was the thing. Like, and that was funny too, because when I used to say that, like, I feel like I could do that, like Jim Morrison. And then I read, when I read Patty's, uh, all, um, Just Kids, she talked about when she got into music, because she wasn't, she would, but she saw Jim Morrison once, she said, she thought to herself, I can do that. Which is yeah. weird also, because I didn't know that, you know, yeah. that she thought that, but it's like, that's that's what she says. That mm. when she was, you know, in New York in mm. the 70s, whatever, and watching all these people who were new, and New York was the hub, and she was like, well, I, that's something I can do. Mm. Yeah. And that's how I felt when I hear it, and I, yeah. Um, and... You know, lots of stuff, but I know I'm not as, uh, not, this is just, yeah, I can look yes. through things and be like, yes, I have this. And I do like musical theater, but I'm not like a musical theater. I like Sweeney yeah. Todd, I actually. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I just started yeah. again. Um, the music. I think it's Sweeney Todd. That was, um, 
I can't Sondheim. Remember. Sondheim, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Have you got some questions? Uh, Not really. No, I'm just. I'm just gonna, I was just going to ask about um, um, if you could meet anybody mm. who alive or dead. Who would? Who? Who would? Who would you want to want to meet? Famous person. Mm -hmm. In music. Anyone. Music. Acting. It could be a guy who just, you sell the fruit on the market stall. It doesn't matter. Hmm. Okay. No, no. These are like the questions I'm like, I don't want to take too long in thinking about it. Who would I like to meet? Well, right now, I have to say, this is like a, a bizarre kind of answer because you're not going to know who I'm talking about. But my favorite recent writer of shows and artists is this writer, David Kale. He's based in New York. He's been living in New York. I saw his show, Harry Clark, in 2018. Um, and it was right after my daughter died. And I just picked a random show. And I was like, you know, it's my son. Do you want to go see the show? And it was after our play closed. And he's like, yeah. And we went. And like, we were watching the show. It was amazing. And we both looked at each other at the same time. And we were like, this is fucking great. Like, we're just <laughs> like, oh my God. And I just became a huge fan. I told all my friends. I saw it three times. And it's very funny. And Billy Crudup starred in it. And he played like all the characters. And then I started following David Kale. And then David did this other show called We're Only Alive for a Short Amount of Time. Now, David is British. Grew, grew up in Luton. And it was his autobi his story about his life. I'm not going to tell it, but it's a pretty intense story. And he also musical, and he's funny, and everything he does, I am like. So I, and he's not like a big celebrity that you mm. know. I, and he loves the way he treat, talks about animals. So like, I feel like I have met him because it's not like you, he's not untouchable. But coincidentally, so I've been following him, and I've turned my friends on to him, and I feel like I'm like this groupie of this person, and yeah, because yeah. he also like the way he, I said, loves animals, and. So just now, his show is opening on March 9th, previews, on the West End in the Ambassador Theatre, Harry Clark, the show that turned me on to oh, him. Oh, wow, yeah. And I'm going, me, Tomas, Tomas saw the show, me, I took him, yeah. and, and Mark, who, and we're going on... Um, on the, yeah. On the 11th. So I'm giving it a plug, not because I'm trying to give it a plug, because David is like really my favorite artist right now. Yeah, and yeah. I have met him. You know, not like we're not buds or anything yeah. like that, mm -hmm. but I just, his heart... And what he writes about, he has yeah. this play called like uh, this this play that he did like about monologues about lonely people and him and this other writer Dale Orlando Smith and it's just so I just telling anyone if I know you're not going to get this on there before but it, maybe it'll be running still and it's with Billy Crudup again mm. but David when he performs so that's one person that I've met that I just adore yeah. but I mean I should answer someone who's um, maybe <laughs> more. <laughs> I just I don't know why I can't no, think like, right now. I like now. that answer. So, no, that's, that's yeah. But I just feel I that's really, really yeah. that's, that's that's a good answer. And go check know? them out because yeah. I can't even believe that I'm here. Like I like yeah. I even wrote I'm like I was gonna seem like I'm a stalker. Like yeah, yeah. I'm on tour while your show is opening and I'm coming. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, people always people always ask. Um, a lot of people ask. You know who's 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 your who's your heroes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people when 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 they talk to when they talk to me like because because you know I I play I play music as well a lot of people think you know oh, I bet you'd love to meet Paul McCartney or mm -hmm. or um, you know if you if you could John Lennon or or you know Stevie Wonder It'd be amazing to meet those people but you know but in the back of my mind I'd like would I really want to meet those people mm -hmm. like if I had the opportunity to I'd I'd probably want to meet someone like. Um, I don't know, like Rowan Atkinson, like somebody that really inspires me from when I was a kid. Do you know what I mean? Right. Someone that, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with those, with those answers. Cause, um, yeah. So it's those people that who cares? Like, <laughs> yeah. I would like to meet like Kafka. I always say like when people ask me about like, who's in like Kafka. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, I, you know, his books are maybe a little neurotic, but like his, his biography just sound like an incredible, you know, person, to meet and really interesting yeah. and it isn't always I actually you know it's funny he's talking about Stevie Wonder when I first came to first time I ever came to London in like 1984 I did like NYU in London um, so I spent the summer and I met like the trumpet players way before I was ever in music yeah. at all met like some I don't know one of the musicians I think he was a trumpet player I don't remember at a club and he invited me and Stevie Wonder was playing we went to play, you know, to see the Stevie Wonder concert and then we went backstage and I got to meet Stevie Wonder Yeah, but you know but still it's true it's like you know it's not always exactly. It's not always the things I, like. Yeah, like I'd like to meet the character of Sam in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I love yeah. him. You know, yeah. like I think about Frodo a lot too. Yeah. Do you want to? I have no. Do you want to ask him to come in or? 
Yeah, is it, we can. Is we that get Mark weird in now? Is that? Yeah, we can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where is he? Mark, <laughs> would you like to be joined here for a second? Are you, you sure? Fine? Are you sure, because sure? it's not. We're not doing you a favor. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, it's okay. You sure? That's okay. I'm sure. Okay. He's, 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 okay. Mark yeah. is the glue of everyone. So he I'm is, say yeah, we, he's we, like yeah. you cannot do any of this without Mark. Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah. Honestly. Awesome. Mark and James. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, yeah. Well, I know the one when Mark comes here, he's, he's, he's plays about 900 instruments, doesn't he? He does everything. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. And he also, Mark <laughs> yeah. also works on my shows, the plays. Yeah. Right. He does the sound. He's done, like, he's doing the show with me in Rhode Island. He, does, like, he works on my friend's show. Like, he does a lot of stuff. And he's an incredible front person as well. Yeah. You know, don't let this fool you. He's I've seen him. <laughs> yeah. He's as a get front man singing. Get some, get, get some shy on us. Yeah. And I saw him do his debut comedy this year, he, my friend's a comedian, and they did a show together, and he, he I opened the show, yeah. and did his stand up, and then yeah, oh, awesome, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we're gonna we're gonna finish on some um, okay. on some quick fire questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, it don't have to be as quick as possible, but um, yeah, <laughs> we can. Um, yeah. So um, question one: um, What's um, what's a desert island disc for you? One one album to listen to for the rest of your life. <sighs> Now I'm like, all of a sudden, because I just saw the Beatles Love album. I'm like, I don't know why that just came in, just because I just saw it. Um, God, that's, I'm so hard with these favorite questions. I know. I, um, it's so hard. I, I, I constantly think about but I this think question. It could be yeah. something like that. I mean, then that's corny in a way, like, the, the greatest hits, the love songs. It's like not yeah. exactly <laughs> hip, right? Um, but, yeah. or, hmm. I think I think mine would I be say, mine would be Billy Joel and Innocent Man. Oh, that, would, really? that would be my my des desert island album because mm. I know the album Back to Front, one of the very first albums I ever bought, and we're going back to New York again, aren't we? You know, with the I do love Billy know. Joel. I always yeah. I'll never not love Piano Man and mm. Captain Jack. I yeah. know those like so it's like I'll never not love Born to Run. Some people go eh, Born to Run, but I'll never not love that song. Yeah, for whatever reason. If I could take a few songs, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a compilation. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah. Was it, who was it, um, Now 48? Was it... Um, oh, it was, um, yeah, Peter Kay, wasn't Peter it? Peter Kay on, on, said, um, um, yeah, the best album in the world is Now 48. It's yeah. got... <laughs> it's like 996 it, uh, or something. Uh, car Share, wasn't it? Car Share, yeah. that's it, yeah. Yeah, Car Share. Um, yeah, so yeah, just take a compilation, that's what I'd do. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'd have to have a compilation of, yeah. like, just amazing songs. It could be from a lot of different things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, sorry. No worries, no worries. Um, where's, where's the best place to eat in uh, New York, do you reckon? Well, one of my favorite places that's not like super expensive, but it's great. It's called Mogador. It's a um, Mediterranean, you know, yeah, a Mediterranean restaurant, Israeli Arabic food. It's They have one in East Village and one in Brooklyn, and I go there all the time, and it's mm. amazing. Great hummus and kebabs and everything, and they're so nice to me, the one in Brooklyn. They always give me guest appreciation. That's not why it's the best rest. It's just a great food, but it's not super expensive. I mean, if you're going to start going like, fan, you know, expensive, then that's a whole other thing. But yeah, yeah. I love Mogador. Yeah, we'll have to check it out next okay. time in New York. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, 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 we're going, yeah, yeah. Um, I should have one. I can't remember what it was, though. Okay, sorry. I can't remember. Okay, all right. Um, I did have it, for God's sake. <laughs> I should have had these written down. We're, yeah, we're, okay. we're, we're very professional at these podcasts, very, as, you, as, you, as you can, you can see. tell. It's, it's very impromptu. And he, yeah. he, he I just, love it. He, he just said, just ask, ask your quick fire questions. They go, I've got questions written down. So what, <laughs> yeah. what can we... Okay. Um, That's good because I'm like, I'm a quick fire person, but suddenly yeah, I can't answer yeah, a question. Absolutely. Don't ask me a favorite question. I always say, people ask me, because I have a hard time with decisions. It's like, I'm a Libra. Yeah. Like, decisions. <laughs> like, don't ask me my favorite color. Yeah. Please. What's your favorite color? Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> Um, so one question we asked um, asked your partner Thomas um, mm -hmm. was, um, "What's the best advice you've ever been given?" Mm. It's a hard question. No, I know. but that it's one I have one answer. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was actually um, Thomas when he told me to you know to keep the momentum going. You know, when I was doing music in the beginning, like I said, when I was writing the song, and he was like, "Do the album, do the album," you know. Because you have momentum and it's so important to keep mm -hmm. momentum and not let that die. And I think that is definitely one of the best pieces of advice. Because I think, you know, once you get that going, you know, it's harder like once you start again, like, you know, to just. So that is definitely one of them. If you, you know, if you have momentum, yeah. just keep it going. It doesn't have to be like, you know, this, 
super pressured, but just to not, just to trust in the momentum. Yeah. Like, I guess that's, that would be my interpretation of it, you okay. know, and go with it. Yeah. Um, Amazing. Uh, the Clash or The Who? See now, because now I'm into, I mean, it's interesting because now I'm going to say The Clash, yeah. even though, aren't, don't they go together? I think when I saw The Who, The Clash opened for them. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. They that's played, a, that's a gig I think and a half, isn't it? The Who played at Chase Stadium. You could barely, you know, this was like when I was like in the 80s, I guess. And The Clash opened. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, no, I would know. <laughs> no, they did. And um, But just right now, I'm more in the mood for The Clash. Although I still would be interesting to meet Pete Townsend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're crazy, crazy. I have like a crush. I'm not a crush on him. Like, oh, I have a crush on him. Yeah. I just was like, I just loved his mind and his stories and the writing. The energy of, when I was yeah. young, I did have a crush on Sting. How how odd, right? I'm sure <laughs> nobody else ever had a crush on Sting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. And finally, um, where can where can everybody? I know we talked about it already, mm. but where can everybody find out um, more about Marla Mace? And um, well, and you can Group. find me on um, Google, just Marla M A R L A, last name Mace M A S E, but my website MarlaMace.com. Um, music sites, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, Apple, not iTunes, whatever, all the stuff. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there about awesome. me. I will say that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can't wait for the new album to yeah. come out. Um, we're very, very excited. And I'm going to put one on, I'm going to get, I'm going to get them all. I'm on vinyl and I'm going to. Yes. Drop yeah. It we, here. Um, yeah. Bring them here. We've, yes. got, well, we've got, we've got, we've got all of Thomas's albums here we've got you know we've got some some other true groove stuff here yeah. as well so you know it's time for me to get them on vinyl get your ass into gear That's and get right. them on vinyl because <laughs> I'm, I'm a on, cult figure I mean I gotta got have like Marlon May's cult absolutely yeah. and people <laughs> want tangible here. stuff they want to hold the exactly. album in their hand have some and CDs who listens to CDs fold as well wouldn't it you know exactly and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we love it I always joke because I'm like I started so and this will end with this because when I started you know and I always say this this is never too late because you never know but like because I started late I'm like I have to be a legend already because it's yeah. like I'm not you know if I was like an age if I started at 12 so now I'd be like 24 or something you know doing music Yeah. you know what I mean but I'm like okay I, you know this is a joke okay I'm not meaning this seriously <laughs> okay <laughs> he's like looking at me so seriously like <laughs> you know I'm at that point so yes yeah. we'll bring it Wonderful. Well, thank Cult. you very much. Oh, thank for, you um, so much for everything you've done for all of us. Thank you. You no, guys no, are it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure. And, and and you know what they say, without without the music, this place wouldn't be here, right? Because we, what would we be doing, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. without the music? And, and it's the music that keeps this place and it's the music that people just love, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And they and if you've got something to say, then sing it, yeah. it? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah we're, um, we're excited about um, what's going to come out of... Um, True Groove and Marla Mace um, yeah. and um, and everything everything in that in that world. So yeah, thank you so much stuff, for being here. And we appreciate you guys because you guys are you guys are the legends. Just <laughs> well, ending we... with that, Rockabye are legends. We <laughs> thank all know you very that. Much. And if you, you want to check out any more um, stuff from Rockabye Records, um, you can find us on all our social medias as well. You can find us on Facebook, uh, TikTok, and Instagram. Uh, you can find um, a few of um, our merchandise bits, um, such as the hoodie that Dad's wearing in um, in different colours um, and um, a host of other merchandise bits uh, such as t-shirts hats and um, and tote bags um, so if you want to if you want to order, order anything from there um, go to rockabyrecords.co.uk you can find all of our all of our merchandise and all of our social media links um, if you do want to support the shop and you're you're a little bit far away um, then um, you can you could just Drop us a comment, drop us a like on any of our posts that you see online. And um, if you are local to us in our, in our tiny little uh, home of Oakham, Rutland, come and see us. Uh, we've got all of our all of our records in stock, um, ranging from a pound all the way up to those lovely, um, expensive, rare records that you all guys love. Um, so for now, thank you very much, Marla. I have one more thing. Go, I'm go sorry. I it's have okay. to say, you, I know who I want to meet. Go for it. Yes, it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is an also sound bizarre. Flacco, the owl. I know this is weird, but I just have to say it quickly. So Flacco, the owl, just died like two weeks ago, and I'm heartbroken, me and like thousands of other people. Flacco <laughs> was an owl that was in the Central Park Zoo, and someone vandalized his cage uh, uh, a year ago, and he got out. And he was born in captivity, 
And so when he got out, no one thought he'd ever survive a second because he never flew. He lived in a cage. He's a Eurasian eagle owl. So that means, you know, they have six foot wingspan. Oh, wow. yeah. Never was able to fly in the enclosure. Never was able to even really spread his wings. And he got out and they tried the first few days to capture him. There's like videos of him in New York, like on Fifth Avenue. And like they're putting cages and throwing him dead mm. rats and he wasn't having it. And then he eventually like was able to fly and he flew and he never, they just realized after a week, like he was, he was hunting his own rats. Yeah. He was getting everything and he lived for a year and everyone was following this, such a hero of defying the odds, like, and how important freedom is. Yeah. Cause he preferred this freedom. And even though he never even knew how to fly or did he learn, he did it. And he was just such an icon. And, he died, unfortunately, last, you know, he crashed into a window or might have been poisoned by rat poison, but he yeah. lived a year in freedom and he's my hero. And I never went, I would love to like mm. meet Flacco in person and be like, I love you so much. And really, <laughs> you can, and just yeah. look him up because people do know him even all over the world. We are going to look But he's up. a New Yorker. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's it's what a way to a end hero. the podca podcast as well. That <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love I'd that. like to meet an owl. Yeah, yeah. Mind but you, owls are, owls are, I mean, I remember me and we took you to go and see some owls when we were, and there was this little little owl about this big and he was, he, I think he was blind. And when the, they came in to, to, to feed him, all the other owls, they just they just let this little guy, little guy just have first dibs, oh, you know? Incredibly and, pleasant. And it was just yeah. incredible. And they just went, when he had enough, the other owls came in and, and it's just like, yeah, I get so where you're coming from with the owl thing. You look up yeah. Flacco now. I'm telling you, Jamie, my, the bass player who was playing with me the yeah, other yeah, day yeah. from Project Blackbird, yeah, Jamie, yeah. he knew about it because he's an animal guy. Like people yeah, all over the world have yeah. heard about it. But being a New Yorker, mm. and I miss his memorial yesterday because I'm here and I'm grateful to be here, but I would like to now have a chance to like sit mm. yeah. and thank Flacco in person. Yeah. So that's so, it. Uh, wonderful. Thank <laughs> you thank so you. much, thank Marla. You. Thank, thank you very you. much, Dad. Yeah, and cool. um, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.